on record. Uh, remind me again, Tom, when did you graduate? 2012. Sorry? 2012. 2012, okay. And where yes. was that from? Cambridge. Cambridge, okay, good. Yes. Right. Hi. Today, I'm very excited to have Dr. Tom Jenkins, who is a vet graduate in 2012 from Cambridge Vet University, to here to speak with us today as our ongoing um, sort of a uh, program on what do vets really do. So Tom has had a very interesting route, so he's not a practicing vet. So today, we're going to speak to Tom a little bit more about that. Hello, Tom. Hi, uh, thanks for having me on. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. So let's start with the most basic question that I ask everybody. Why did you want to be a vet? Easy. <laughs> I'd always wanted to be a vet for as long as I could remember. I just have a real love of animals. I think they teach us so much. They teach us that there's multiple ways of being in this world. If you ever feel that your sort of troubles are getting on top of you, just uh, think of what life is like for a an ant on the floor or a mountain gorilla picking a tick off the, his friend in front of him or whatever it might be. I just think they give you a great view on the world. Humans have a tendency to be too anthropocentric and I think um, animals sort of broaden our horizons and our minds. So I think age three, I was given a cuddly toy, which was a gorilla. I wasn't sure at that stage whether it was a gorilla or a monkey. So he's called Gila Monkey. And then someone, when I was much too young, let me watch Gorillas in the Mist. Um, with Diane Fossey and she was a massive inspiration for me so I, I just I, th I remember I think like age six or seven we had to fill in a worksheet saying what we wanted to be and I filled in um, zoological veterinary surgeon with a few too many O's in zoological. Very good so uh, I remember watching the gorillas in the mist as well like I said I was way too young for that but it was an amazing movie so I do amazing. appreciate yeah. that very very much so when you went to vet college you went to Cambridge vet college um why did you choose Cambridge they chose me <laughs> I'd, I'd always wanted to be um, a vet and I'd always wanted to go to Oxford to be a vet um only sort of when it came to apply did I realize that Oxford doesn't have a vet school. <laughs> and so then um, it was suggested that Cambridge might be, that, you know, there's Oxford and Cambridge, and uh, despite the rivalries. And um, then my school only had one prospectus from Cambridge, um, because when you apply to Cambridge, you have to choose a college to apply to. And I didn't know that there's like 30 colleges. And so I found this prospectus for this particular college. I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick that college. Turned out that was an all girls college. Uh, <laughs> so you can imagine why sort of a 18 year old boy might think that was an attractive college to go to um, but yeah that, that wasn't to be uh, but somehow I managed to sort of um, uh, make my way through the application process and, and they accepted me and interestingly sort of the day after I got my acceptance letter from Cambridge everyone else rejected me without interview I think I, I, I you know I was keen to go to Cambridge anyway but that's kind of how the application process went just for anyone that's facing that process and they get rejections from elsewhere you know don't worry about it just if, if you want to be a vet just go to a vet school and you'll be a vet it's great it sounds as though you're almost uh, meant to go to cambridge isn't it <laughs> yeah i mean definitely i would say um when i got there it you know it just felt like the place i was meant to be i loved my time there and i would highly recommend it Good. Talk to us a little bit about college. How was it like? Did you, was there any sort of uh, challenges that you faced during college? Yeah, um, I'm not a terribly vetty vet. And what I mean by that is there's some people that just, just really love the subject and that's their everything and then throw themselves into it and they want to become the world expert on the canine pancreas or, you know, something like that. Whereas um, I, I have kind of broader interests. And in fact, what attracts me to the veterinary world is that it does allow you to have this sort of broader focus as I was just talking about. Um, but the course itself is obviously very, very intensive. I remember um, second year pharmacology course at Cambridge. I think it's like one of the most fact intensive exams in the whole world in terms of how much you have to remember. Um, and I found that, you know, I, I integrated, everyone at Cambridge integrates in their third year. They take a separate degree. So you actually graduate after three years before continuing on to clinical school. And I studied zoology. And that, I felt, was much more intellectually rigorous. It was less about how many facts can you remember and then prove you remember them and then forget and then remember this new set of facts. 
and more about can you engage with the material? Can you come up with your own ideas and theories and test them out based on the available evidence? So I enjoyed third year. Also allowed me to bring in sort of did acting, stand up comedy, uh, rowing, different activities. Whereas the the intensity of course um, can prohibit you doing too many other things. And I'd say that was the one downside. Um, the upside is um, yeah. It's a it's a it's a wonderfully structured program. It's not an easy program to get lost in. You know, you have to turn up to this thing and this thing, and if you don't, people notice. So that the structure, I think, helps some people. Um, but I loved my time at uni for sure. Mm. And uh, talk to us a little bit more about when you graduated. What do you do after you graduate? So, before I went to vet school, a, a sort of thirteen, I had a I had a paper round. And the paper round was paying one pound per day, right? So for each round that I did, I, I made a pound. And um, I took on three paper rounds. So I was making three pounds a day. And I thought, okay, I've done all right here. But that was kind of like the peak capacity of how many paper rounds I could do. And so I thought, well, I've got to find a way to make more than three pounds a day. And I started teaching myself to do web development. And then I found that you can actually outsource the web development and just manage the project. So I was outsourcing the web development and working with clients um, largely in the US uh, and Canada, North America. And um, that, sorry, excuse me, that um, product management experience um, gave me my interest in um, business, in the sort of um, more commercial side of things. I thought, well, I've always wanted to be a vet. You know, people are saying, well, why don't you just do this? Why don't you do web development? It's going really well. Why don't you continue? And actually, I remember at my interview for Bristol, having my little record of achievement, which I'd somehow taken along with me, which sounds completely cringeworthy now. Um, I had printed out the different websites I'd developed and the games I'd designed. And they're like, just do this. Like, come on, you know, why would you go down the veterinary route? Just carry on with this. This looks great. I was like, no, no, I want to be a vet. I want to be a vet. Obviously, didn't convince them. Um, but so when I went into vet school, I thought, well, what I'd love is if I could qualify as a vet, because I've always wanted to do that, but then go into the business side of things. And vets run their own businesses often. You know, I'd been out seeing practice, getting the work experience that you need to get into vet school. And my local practice, um, Park Vets, who I'll forever be grateful to, a great local practice in, um, well, group of practices in Leicestershire, um uh, they invited me into their partner meetings to talk about sort of digital marketing web design and just get a taste they knew i was interested and so they let me and i you know i got to see hey there's this interesting other stuff that goes on behind that facilitates all the great stuff we do for our patients it allows to keep the practice running the doors open it, allow, it allows us to buy the shiny new equipment that we use to improve the lives of our patients so i kind of had that business interest so getting towards the end of vet school, I thought I was going to take a management, management consulting job. I had a management consulting job lined up. And the idea was that I would leave the veterinary sector, go into management consulting, get broad business experience, and then come back into the veterinary sector. But then I read a book called The Growth Map by Jim O'Neill. And he outlines the BRIC concept of so Brazil, Russia, India, China as the world's emer emerging economies, very high growth um, economies. I thought, well, if, the, if you've got a high growth economy, you've got an emerging middle class. If you've got an emerging middle class, you probably have an emerging population of pet owners. What they will need high standards of veterinary care for their patients too. Maybe I can start my career on, on, on that thesis, uh, go out to one of these countries and help build a, uh, um, a, a group of veterinary clinics um, combining the interest for, for veterinary medicine with the interest in um, business. And so I just jumped on Google. I found a group of um, clinics in Beijing, um, in China, four clinics, and I e emailed them. And after a couple of Skype interviews, they said, yeah, come along. You know, I just emailed them saying, hey, happy to throw my hat in the ring as a vet. But if you've got ambitions to grow the business, I'd love to help on that side too. And, you know, again, full credit to them. Very grateful to them. Um, they gave me a job and I got on the plane to China thinking, I hope this is OK. <laughs> I'd never been to China before. I didn't know anyone in China before. The only thing I had to tell me this was a real business was a website. You know, it's... Um, but it was, and it was all good. And it was, yeah, it was great. It was a great experience. That's a very long answer to your question, Lennon. <laughs> yeah. 
Pretty cool. That's a very interesting answer because uh, remind me again because it is in the time you spent in China, you actually learned how to speak Mandarin, didn't you? Uh, <laughs> would we say that uh, a little bit? Yeah, and not a survival survival Mandarin we call it. Um, although there were some fairly sort of hair raising moments early on where I didn't speak a word of Chinese. So um, the first time um, I went out in Beijing. So with some of the colleagues from the veterinary clinic, we went out for a few drinks. I was coming back from that night out. And I had been told that my address was, you know, where I lived is Xiaoyaoju. So I say to the taxi driver, Xiaoyaoju, as in I want to go to Xiaoyaoju. And um, he takes me to Xiaoyaoju, which is just a district, uh, an area in Beijing. It's not my apartment name, it's just an area. And he's like, you know, here we are, sort of thing in Chinese. And um, I'm like, oh, okay, I don't recognize this. So I remember getting out of the taxi and um, trying to, I knew I lived near the subway station. So I found these guys um, still, still out at that time. It must have been like 1 a.m. And I mimed sort of standing on a subway. Somehow they understood what I meant. They pointed me in the right direction. I think I might have jumped some um, uh, train tracks to get across to the building that I recognize as being my apartment. But so yeah, that, that provided a very strong incentive to at least learn some Mandarin. Well done. And uh, I, talk to us a little bit more about the veterinary care over there. Obviously you've worked in UK, you've seen UK practices and they have it in China as well. What do you yeah. think of the uh, vet care? What same, different, what's the difference? What's the attitude to pets in the area? I was out in China for four and a half, five years, um, and I saw incredible progress during the time I was there. Um, even when I arrived, there was obviously, um, you know, a big range of, you know, not great clinics to, to pretty good clinics. Um, the education of the Chinese vets was also developing while I was there. You know, the, if you think of universities out there, the vet schools, they tend to be agricultural universities, and they tend to have a focus on production animal medicine. Also, in terms of like culturally, um, the veterinary career is not held in terribly high esteem. Um, I would say, I, you know, these are obviously generalizations, um, but that was certainly the generalization I picked up from, from the colleagues I worked with. And then they didn't get a lot of exposure to companion animal medicine. So a lot of it was kind of apprenticeship. So the, the sort of veterinary nurses, in inverted commas that I was working with, were actually vets who were apprenticing to become vets and you, you got you were basically became a vet when you got given a job as a vet um, but I, the other thing is because of that approach this sort of apprenticeship approach you could also find people that are incredibly skilled in one um, portion of veterinary medicine so like a very very adept ultrasonographer but then they wouldn't necessarily be able to have the broader base conversation about um, you know another topic I would say you know most ultra veterinary ultrasonographers in the UK would be able to discuss basic dermatology, right? But if you've apprenticed and you've just been doing ultrasonography the whole time and you don't have that broader base to your knowledge, then that's not, it's not the same. So there was a slight difference there, but the, the, you've got some incredible vets out in China and you've got incredible veterinary clinics out there. I know because, you know, I ran some of them. So, uh, and you've got a massive group out there. You've got a couple of massive groups, you know, you're talking a thousand clinics in one of the veterinary groups out in China. I think something like 500 clinics in the other group. Um, so it's come a long way and it's, 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 it's leapfrogging in a way because they don't have to go through all the sort of development stages that we went through. They can just take the best and, and, and apply it right away. And you've got this soaring uh, pet ownership numbers. Still again, from a low starting point, I think when I was there, it was about 10% of households own a pet. And if you think over here, it's more like 50%. Um, so the economics of um, a veterinary clinic are, are different when you've got that a lower level of penetration. But yeah, super interesting to see it. And um, I, I, you know, I was at a conference in the US recently when they were talking about um, uh, taking things from the US and, and providing them in China and how much China could learn from us. And I think it's actually, it, it's been gone, begun to flip where we can actually look at China, see the stuff they're doing and learn from them. The use of technology, a mobile first approach to veterinary medicine, that kind of thing. It's very much taking hold over there and we've got to play catch up here i think so if you were able to sort of a list in your experience maybe like three things that uk needs to play catch up or should really be looking into china in terms of uh, progression in uh, veterinary yeah. medicine what would your three things be 
Yeah, so I would say um, certainly the uh, obviously I'm biased because I run a company called PetDAP, but the app based care, the mobile first, the accessibility of the um, vet medicine. So they have an app out there called Weixin or, or WeChat, um, which can basically do everything. It's like a, a, a WhatsApp, but on steroids, it does lots of different things. You can even run your investments through WeChat, I think. So um, that a lot of the veterinary care can be initially delivered through there, which broadens the top of the funnel in terms of uh, pet owners being able to bring their issues to the vet. I worry that in the UK and in other markets, veterinary care ends up becoming a rounding error in the broader pet care experience. We only address 8% of all pet issues as vets. 92% of pet issues go unaddressed by veterinary expertise. And so we've got work to do to make our expertise more accessible so that more of those issues come to us so that we can advocate for those those pets as well as the ones that we do see mm. in terms of other aspects i think it's it's hard to compare but i would say i think there is some merit to the apprenticeship model of um, veterinary education i feel like i came out of vet school uh, with still some worries about you know surgery and things like that and clearly we all do apprentice to an extent post graduation you know once we've graduated mm -hmm. And incorporating a bit more of that model and formalizing that model, um, I think, could, could, could be interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, talk to me a little bit about the cultural attitude. As you know, I'm Chinese. I'm from Singapore. But certainly, I do, know a lot of, uh, I do have a lot of Chinese friends. And the attitude towards animals may not be as, uh, in my opinion, may not be as uh, sort of uh, clued in or concerned or as wholesome as uh, it is in uh, Britain, which is one big reason why I decided to work in UK rather than in Singapore. What was the experience like over there? What, how did they treat the animals? Interesting. Um, I think I saw this change even during the time that I was there. Um, people started to talk about the merits of animal welfare legislation. Um, I remember there was a case that we dealt with at one of our hospitals um, when I was out there of someone throwing a dog off a balcony and it landed on a car windscreen and the windscreen broke its fall. So it survived and we did off the surgery and it actually got rehomed with a celebrity who had been on China's Got Talent or some such show. Um, so it's a good news story in the end for, the, for the animal in the end, but um, the only crime that pet owner had broken in, in mistreating the animal so severely was in the property damage they committed on the car. Um, the dog was seen as their pro this is my superficial understanding i'm not a lawyer but what i was told was the dog is the owner's property if they want to throw it off a balcony uh, it's okay except for the consequences for other people rather than the consequences for that dog mm -hmm. so that was you know that was very early on in my entry into china i thought well that's you know that's troubling let's see what can we do as a company what can we do as a team of uh, patient advocates and uh, and vets uh, nurses etc to help address that and you did see that start to happen um, while I was there and nothing to do with me but just during the time I was there um, and you saw people clearly I saw a biased population because I saw a lot of pet owners incredibly passionate about their animal sometimes it was interesting in that they loved their animal they didn't necessarily love all animals right so and I think so, this is an interesting trend I believe in pets as proxies for the natural world. They give, if you're a pet owner, you have this connection to an animal and you, you, you kind of have the empathy, your empathy is extended to all animals. Okay, if I value this life, this way of be, being, how is this different to this animal, that animal, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And that kind of gives us a guardianship over the natural world. I, I, maybe it's a fairly um, uh, sort of airy fairy way of thinking about things, but it's kind of where I get my kicks. Um, and, and I think we're seeing the beginnings of that, but um, not necessarily, you know, I think it's the tr same true, it's true here, right? It's hard to generalize. Just because you love your, your cat doesn't mean you love dogs or you love other animals, right? Mm. The other thing I would say is um, pet owners um, were often first generation pet owners. If you think of the recent history of um, uh, the communist uh, party and communism in China um, until there was that sort of liberalization sort of in the 80s onwards um, pet ownership was seen as a, a bourgeois activity that was very much frowned upon um, so the pet ownership now is I, I think um, it, it's fine and, and in some ways encouraged and there's an expression of affluence um, 
but they're first generation pet owners often. So then do they know that they should be getting their dogs vaccinated? Do they know that, you know, flea treatment, heartworm, that sort of thing. There's a lot of pet owner education to happen. But then again, you see sort of 70% compliance gaps in those things in the UK too. So we've got work to do too. So before we start sort of casting aspersions, let's look closer to home. But you did see that. You saw people that were spending a lot of money on their pet for the latest grooming and hair dye and all kinds of different stuff that probably their pet could have done without, um, but not getting their dog vaccinated. And then you'd have parvo cases and terribly sad, you know, 50% mortality rate in those types of cases. And you just wish you could have said, look, if, if someone had told them they would have done it, but they just didn't know to do it. It sounds as though education or the lack of is a huge over there. And that usually starts with the, con the consciousness of whether to spread the education in the first place or not. And it's interesting what you say that, you know, in UK, 8% of people gets, or rather the 8% 8, 8 of animals are treated by vets and 92% by elsewhere. So to speak. Yeah, so a lot of the time they're just hoping for the best. They just encounter an issue and they hope for the best or they jump on Dr. Google or, yeah. or ask their sort of best friend's cousin who happens to own a pet shop or something like that, which, you know, at different times may be appropriate things to do, but I doubt that's the appropriate thing to do 92% of the time. Mm, no, I totally agree that there's a lot of instances where I see clinical cases and uh, owners would have said that I've spoken to five different people before coming to you then I'm like, okay, why? <laughs> but there yeah. you go. But I can uh, appreciate that. It's interesting to see that in China, the education is slightly different, whereby the complete lack of education is there. And if they were told potentially from a uh, vet or somebody with authority, then they could potentially listen and actually get better results with the animals. I think the intention think, is there. Yeah, the intention is certainly there. And it, 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 often they didn't grow up with their family having pets, so they don't have that sort of role modeling going yeah. on. The other thing I would say, actually, you just sort of teased this out and um, think about it now. You did see more second opinions happening in China where they'd consult a vet and then they'd want to consult another vet to see if that was the right thing. Um, higher um, aversion to the risk of anesthetic, definitely a cultural, um, cultural barriers around euthanasia. Um, that, that was present in some cases. Um, but this sort of idea of getting a second opinion or needing more touch points, at least, even if it was they'd come back to speak to me or the same vet, mm. um, they'd want to come and talk to you several times before mm. making the decision. Mm. Now, this actually replicates the millennial decision making that we see in the UK. Millennials like to have, they see vets or experts as a sort of concierge service where you're guiding them through a decision making process. They're highly compliant, but they need more touch points in their decision-making process to take to take them along the journey to going along with what you're recommending for the pet. So there's interesting parallels there, I think. It's very interesting you bring up this point because uh, it's almost as though it's almost cultural, whereby in UK uh, there's many pet owners who is actually almost embarrassed to go and ask for a second opinion or leaving their vet thinking that they were deemed as an unloyal or disloyal to, to, to mm -hmm. the vet. And they're almost embarrassed to ask for a second opinion. Whereas um, in China, maybe it's a Chinese culture. They're just more direct. It's like, I have nothing against you. I just want to make sure I get a second opinion for my sake to make sure I'm doing the right thing. And the reality is that sometimes when they get a second opinion that just um, supports the first opinion and they go to say that, yeah, you're right. And then that's how you sort of build up trust. But there isn't that stigma of, uh, okay, let's not um, annoy this vet by going to another vet. And, and hence, there is that. Uh, I'll be seen as a troublesome client uh, as much as what I see in UK. There is, there is yeah. a very good point you brought over there. Part of it is, the I think, is the esteem in which the vets are held. So I think the vets in general, culturally in the UK, are held in very high esteem. And in China, I would say in general, less so. Uh, and again, it's changing. It's moving fast. And you've got to bear in mind, I've been back in the UK for a few years now. So if it changed fast in the period I was there, I'm sure it's changed even more since I've been gone. But I think that's part of the issue. The other part is um, sort of uh, the collegiate nature of the profession. And that is progressing in China, but there wasn't so much of the sort of organizational professionalization stuff going on. Whereas in the UK, for example, if a vet comes to see me having, if a sorry, pet owner comes to see me having seen you, I need to be requesting records from you and all that sort of thing um, to, to maintain that professional conduct. That's not necessarily the case in China. 
Oh, this uh, sounds like there's quite a huge room for expansion and growth and improvements uh, for a potentially very large market because uh, um, it, it's, it's interesting you're talking about how they may spend a lot of money on changing the color of the hair. Not necessarily a good thing, but not so much on vet bills and how they may like the animal so much, but have a huge disregard for the rest of nature, which is a bit weird. Uh, but that almost comes back to the whole idea of property, isn't it? Because this is mine. That's why I take care of it. Those are not mine. So it's not really my problem. But it's quite interesting that you brought it up like that. Uh, tell me, talk to me a little bit more about um, your pets app. So that's the baby that you've been fostering for all this time. And I know it just recently yeah. launched and uh, yeah. you mentioned that early on. So uh, t tell us, tell us more, more about it. What exactly does it do? Yeah. So after leaving China, I came to the UK and I ran a veterinary group here and I saw that um, basically uh, being a vet is, I know we just talked about the differences, but it's the same. You're, you're advocating for pets and you're trying to convince owners to do what you're recommending would be in the best interest for the pet. So you try and take the pet owner along with you. Mm. And um, the way I did this when I was operating clinics was, you know, a lot of it was spent coaching vets into here's how you can uh, make this recommendation. Here's how you spot the signs of this. And, you know, I'm not um, a clinically brilliant vet. Um, however, in terms of the consultation skills, I would say, you know, uh, hopefully above average and so you could coach the vets one by one into how to advocate for their patients you see it a lot where um, a vet will lift up the the lip of a dog they see it very clearly you know needs a dental and they'll say something like oh you should maybe start to think about considering getting a dental for your dog and the owner says oh yeah sure and so the vet thinks they've done their job in recommending a dental mm -hmm. and the pet owner thinks they've done their job in saying yes but what the pet owner is really saying yes to is, yes, I will maybe start to consider thinking about getting a dental for my dog. So then what happens is the next year that pet owner comes back and the same thing happens again. And the, do the poor dog never gets the dental that it needs. Right. Mm -hmm. And no one's done anything that inherently wrong there. Everyone thinks they're doing their job. So it occurred to me, you know, is there a way to systematize this process so that they take some of the pressure off that sort of 15 minute, 10 minute consultation where the vet has to recommend everything possible that that pet could need in a very short space of time and the owner is facing information overload. And that's just for the owners that even make it into the vet in the first place. And as we just discussed, a lot of owners don't come in or don't come in as often as they should. But you have this high trust position, which we've also talked about. The vets are held in very high regard. So if you could layer on convenience and accessibility onto this trusted relationship, could we move that, the needle on that 8% number of 8% of pet issues coming to the vet? Could we, could we double it? Could we get 16% of pet issues um, being addressed by uh, veterinary expertise? So PetZap is really our effort to increase the accessibility of, of, of veterinary, veterinary expertise provide pet owner convenience so that when a pet owner comes across a pet issue, the people best placed to help them make that decision can help them make that decision. And that is their existing vet new team. Very good. And how is the uh, pet app getting along? So um, to date, we've helped just over 50,000 pets at 140 clinics with 75,000 virtual care interactions. Um, and we launched this version of the product in middle of January. So it's been a busy time, but it's been great to see it, you know, doing what we hoped it would do with sort of text chat, digital payments, video consults, push notifications, that sort of thing. What challenges have you faced with PetSet? I think the challenge has been um, getting to the point where we are, where we've got a product that does what we hoped it would do. So we started PetSet two years ago and we started with a video consulting uh, product. So literally the owner would press a button and it would ring through to a vet and an available vet at the clinic would answer the video and they'd do a video consult. Now a video consult in isolation is not a terribly good experience because the average video consult is seven minutes and the first three and a half minutes are typically spent uh, with the owner under the bed trying to retrieve the cat and the next three and a half minutes are spent hoping that the cat sneezes in exactly the way the owner has described. If the cat doesn't sneeze in the way the owner has described, the vet doesn't feel able to make a diagnosis or give any recommendations. Mm. So then the vet doesn't feel like they've added any value. Us vets are typically um, shy billers. You know, we're a self-selecting population of not financially motivated individuals. So if we don't feel like we've provided any value, we're not going to charge for it. 
So you spent seven minutes without reaching a diagnosis and you've been paid nothing for doing it. It just sounds like an awful experience, right? And then the other part of it is because pet owners hold the vets in such high regard, we found that they would often request the video call having paid for a video call. And then before the vet answered, they'd hang up. And we said to them, you know, we did user interviews with like, why? why? You, know, you paid for a video consult, why did you hang up? And they said, well, I didn't realize I was gonna be put straight through to a vet. Um, and I wasn't sure that my issue justified bothering a vet with. I didn't wanna waste the vet's time. So they were almost too respectful of the vet's time, even though they'd paid to, to access that expertise. And I saw the same thing had happened in the clinics that I'd been, when I'd been managing clinics, where no matter how much you've trained your vets to say, is there anything else I can help you with? Do you have any other questions for me? The, the owner would say, no, that's all great doc. And then they'd go out to reception. And as they're paying at reception, they ask the receptionist all the questions that they should have just asked the vet. But by that time, the vet's in the next consultation and is unable to help. So you miss out on those patient advocacy opportunities. It just shows you how important the receptionists and the nurses are in the, the, the customer experience. So the new version of the product introduced this text chat backbone um, and has the re receptionist and the nurses on there as well as the vets. So you still can get the video consult with a vet or with a nurse, but it starts with a text chat, even lower effort, more accessible, and you don't have that sort of intimidating thing of, you know, this issue, is it going to be bothering, am I going to be bothering a vet with this issue unnecessarily? Uh, because uh, you, you start your chat with the receptionist. Wow, that's uh, very interesting. What about the future of Pets App? How do you foresee what, let's say five years from now, what is Pets App going to look like? I guess as, as a vet, I see my job as being a, a patient advocate, right? So we advocate for our patients. And we're saying that you can also do this digitally. And I think at the minute, there's something of a dichotomy between the online experience and the offline experience. And, you know, you can interact with me digitally, but then you can interact with me in the real world. And those are two separate channels, right? We are already starting to see these channels blur where you've got this seamless online to offline experience. And we've already seen uh, cases which are, you know, really encouraging for me of people actually using Pets app while in the clinic. So um, if a, a vet is prescribing tablets for a cat, then they can jump on Pets app and send a link to a YouTube video of how to tablet your cat rather than having to take the time to do that. What I'd love is to build in more automation assisting the vets where if they prescribe tablets for the first time to a cat, that owner automatically gets sent the video, the, the, their preferred video of how to tablet a cat. So those kinds of things that, that save time, but really help. Because I know when I was working as a vet, I don't know how many tablets I prescribed to, to cats, but I bet, you know, 90% of them never made it into the cat, which shows me up, doesn't it? Because it means my treatment doesn't do its job, doesn't work. The treatment that I think the cat's getting, again, we're pretending to ourselves that we've done our job job but really they're not getting the medication that i said it needed um but i don't have the time you know we're again we put, put a lot of blame on on vets you know or, uh, you know how come you didn't show them how to tablet the cat or how come you didn't make a proper recommendation around the dental or whatever it might be but we have 10 minutes to do everything and it's it's a lot of pressure on us and we want to serve as many patients as we can so if we have these structures and systems in place to support us in doing doing the work that we need to do I think that would be very powerful and I hope Pets App can, be, can, be, can, can continue to be part of that. Mm. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you a question that has been, uh, uh, I want to get your take on it. So currently in our profession, you know, we ha do have some statistics that's associated with the vet uh, world. One is that uh, we have got a fairly high depression rate, you know, vet life, which is our equivalent for Samaritan's uh, hotline. Yeah has sort of doubled in calls over the past few years and keeps doubling every year. We also yeah. got a very high attrition rate, a dropout rate of reported to be sort of 38% about two years ago, whereby more than a third of vets would actually quit to be vets yeah. if they could actually afford it. And we also have got a very high troubling statistics of a high suicide rate, whereby vets are twice more likely to end their lives themselves compared to the medical profession and four times more likely than the general public. Yeah. Um, I wanted your take on that really. Why do you think, first of all, have you, do you know anybody who have gone through such things and why do you think that is happening? Yeah, it's one of these things that is often um, silent and unseen 
until it suddenly it is very much a problem uh, you know someone is facing burnout or um someone is you know another article about veterinary suicide so it's one of those things where even if you're not seeing it yourself it's it's definitely happening and earlier i said you know i'm not a very vet vetty vet in that you know i don't read um I like reading biographies or fiction in my spare time. I don't read veterinary medical journals typically, unless something particularly striking has caught my eye. Um, mm. So, you know, in my friendship group, I think Cambridge helped with this actually. I was the only vet student in my college. So obviously in the vet school, I, I hung out with lots of vets, but also in, in my college, you know, you're hanging out with theologians, um, politics students, psychology mm. students, philosophers, all that kind of stuff. So which, computer scientists, which is, is kind of fun. And, Again, it's about having that broader view in the world. But I think um, for a lot of vets, they get very caught up in the identity of, of being a vet. I remember distinctly, I won't say who it was, but we had a lecturer or a guest lecturer come in and they said, if someone took my um, MRCVS away from me, I'd shoot myself. You know, they, they said that to a, a class of students. And it's that kind of thing. I think it's that kind of thinking. I know, you know, he was mainly joking, I'm, I'm sure. And I don't, you know, again, won't say who it was because it's not fair to, to hold them to the level of criticism in this context. But I worry about that kind of, our whole identity is tied up in our, in our work and our identity of being a vet. And then couple with that with the fact that to get through vet school, you have to succeed all the time. You have to pass every exam. You have to show up and you have to pass. Then when you get, become a vet, it's always failing. It, you know, that you can either meet expectations or fail. When you do it, when you're taking blood from an animal, the owner expects that you will get it right first time every time. You can't do better than getting it right first time. So if you take two tries, you've you you could persuade yourself that you've failed. A, a surgery, a, a neutering surgery. You either straightforwardly new to that animal with no complications, no issues, in a, you know, quickly um, without need for help, or you don't. You, you can't really do an amazing space surgery. You can't get an A-star space surgery. It's either you did it right or, you know, you didn't. And, and I think so. You've been trained to be succeed, 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 and you've been selected for that. And then you're entering a profession where it's much more nuanced than that. Uh, and so you're suffering these sort of high failure rate, having not had experience of that. And then that's your whole identity. And I think that is, again, this is sort of couch armchair psychology, but I don't think that is a healthy way to be. And I think that those are things that we need to address in the profession. And um, we also need a bit more positive self-talk. Being a vet is wonderful. And I don't worry. I mean, people like me who've been in practice and left practice, that's not a problem is people in practice that wish they weren't that is a problem and how do we make these make sure these careers are rewarding for them and how do we make sure our expectations of vets are reasonable expectations and for me anytime you have an expectation of someone that's got to be reciprocal they should have expectations of you so where's the duty of care to the vet in, in, in these in this set of expectations um, I think these are all things you know these are conversations that are happening and I'm very glad they're happening um, but that's kind of how I how I think about it. Mm. How about you, Lennon? How, what, what's your what's your take? It's uh, I I totally agree with you. I I think there is a there is a lot of the uh, whole perfectionist syndrome, how we're all getting there, and we're actually literally not taught to fail or saying that failing is bad. I mean, personally, um, as many may know, I have failed my first, third, and fifth year in vet college, and because of that, you know. I'm held back every time. I'm almost penalized. I'm saying that that is wrong. We shouldn't have failed. So when it comes to a world whereby some dogs, they just won't sit still. Some owners, they just are um, not reasonable, <laughs> uh, no matter what you do. And you just cannot succeed. And if you don't understand that that's actually okay, uh, it is tough. It is tough. So I think there is a lot, it's a multifactorial issue. That is not just recent. It, is, it goes back many, many years already. And the thing is that it is very, very underlying that nobody says too much about it. So the general perception of the public is, wow, you're a vet. I always wanted to be a vet. But yeah. once I tell them this sort of few statistics, they're like, what? Never heard of it, so to speak. Yeah. But that is reality. You know, these numbers are not made up. So I think there's a lot of work Definitely. done from the very, very start of the selection of students into vet college, 
what they're teaching at vet college, uh, the perception of the public of, uh, of, of vets, and that perception only starts with the vets themselves. How do vets, how do we perceive ourselves? And if that is not healthy, then certainly the public have got no other way of looking at it apart from having the perception that either it's not true or a poor perception. So yeah. that's the challenge. But yeah, no, th thanks for that. Let's pretend because uh, I, I can certainly tell that you know, despite being a vet, you love what you're doing and you're actually not 100% in practice vet type, so to speak. I'd like to mm. sort of uh, uh, get your sort of a take on that. If you had a magic wand, if you could do anything you want, mm -hmm. what do you think would help to improve these problems or these statistics that we currently face? Hmm, uh, that, that you're putting me on the spot, but I, I, there's, there's, a, there's a few things I would do, and I think you were right when you talked about selection. And this, this is somewhat controversial because one of the things I love about my veterinary passport is that you can become anything you want with it you know actually the veterinary training was a very good grounding for going into business management because it teaches you problem solving and, and the way the way to approach uh, challenging issues uh, and joined up thinking you know systems fit thinking um so i think the broad base of the training is great i would say i'm not sure the training sets up people up to succeed in the most common roles for vets. And to be a great GP vet, I don't think you need to have accumulated a whole load of A stars. Um, and it, you know, it helps, I'm not saying it's a, it's a negative, I'm just not sure that's the key qualification criteria. Mm -hmm. I would say there are other sort of practical skills that are, are much more important that should perhaps be um, thought about. Um, prior to the final year of university training, which is often what happens. And I know there are different approaches and I've heard sort of great things about the Nottingham approach, mm. uh, for example, mm. um, but also people skills. Mm. Um, that's, a, that's a huge one. I, it's one of the things I loved about um, practicing as a vet, to be honest, mm. that you have a partner in the care of each animal and that partner is the owner of the animal. And, mm. and this is another source of a veterinary grief, I think, a, 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 and issues is we see ourselves as responsible for that animal, mm. right? No. We're not. The owner is responsible for that animal. We are an advocate for that animal and we are a partner in the care of the animal, but the owner is responsible. The owner sees themselves as responsible for it. The owner doesn't see us respon as responsible for it, but we see ourselves responsible. How can we be responsible for animals that we see so seldom? Mm. You know, again, 92% of that animal's issues on average are gonna be addressed by someone other than us. Mm. And yet we have this idea that we're going to um, shepherd that animal to um, some incredible life full of 100% compliance with everything we could possibly want for it. And, that, and that when that doesn't happen, we feel terrible about it. And I think there's a little bit of just, you know, OK, you can let that go because you have your role to advocate for that patient. But the responsibility for that animal is not 100% yours and maybe it's not even mostly yours. Um, mm. But in terms of partnering with that pet owner to try and sit, you know, see that person's personality, their sort of the landscape, their model of reality, and to try and um, tailor your approach to them, your partnership with them, to then unlock compliance and concordance with what you're recommending for that animal, that can be a very enjoyable thing to do, right? You, you can really sync up with someone and you can feel it when you got that quick to connect piece right. But it can also be a horrible thing to do. If that's not your bag, um, having a relentless back-to-back -back, back -back afternoon consult session can be an absolute nightmare. And again, selecting for that would be uh, useful. And um, Selecting sounds harsh. Mm. What about coaching for that? Um, mm. that? That would be great too. Um, so I think I've conveniently dodged your question somewhat. Um, no. <laughs> but I think there's a start of an answer somewhere in there. On the contrary, I think you have hit a big nail on the head. So I think uh, both selection and coaching would play a big part. But it comes back to, is that person a people person? Many people, they want to be vets because they love animals. I prefer animals to humans, hence I'm a vet. And in my mind, yeah. that is a nightmare. It's like, no, behind every animal, there's a human. And if you're not good exactly. with human, you are going to struggle.
because all you're dealing with every day is humans. Yes, there are animals involved, but there are humans involved as well. And they almost, if without a human, there isn't a pet in the first place. So that I think you have totally nailed it on the head about we can be taught so much about animals, but if we do not know the human component side of things, it is always back to, I, I remember in college, they asked me the question, which is a better vet? The vet that has diagnosed the most amazing rarest disease and come up with the most amazing miraculous cure or a vet that can convince the owner to give the tablets five times a day. So that has always stuck in my mind. I'm like, okay, a very, very good point, yeah. so to speak. Uh, but yeah. no, thanks for that. Um, I'd like to uh, ask you another question. So another thing that uh, sometimes we do hear people say is that, oh, you are a vet. You must be um, minted. What do you <laughs> say about that when you hear that? I say, um, <laughs> if only. And <laughs> I say, um, well, it's what I said before. We are a self-selecting population of non-financially motivated individuals. I went to Cambridge University for six years. I graduated with a first up class degree after three years. I saw people graduating at the same time, going out on starting salaries of 60K um, in the city uh, and you know big bonuses. And I was gonna go and study for another three years to earn a starting salary about half that. Um, and that's fine. That's my choice. Um, and it's a choice I'd make again and again and again because money money is important. You know, I came from you know a fairly humble background, and I, I know what it's like to not always have enough money. That's not a great position to be in. And vets are lucky in that, in general, um, we earn enough to you know hopefully not be in that position. Although that's not always true, um, but we're certainly not minted. Uh, I, I think we can quickly disabuse. Um, oh, there's vets that have done very well for themselves. Don't get me wrong. Oh, the average salary if you've got any uh, for your earnings um then uh don't do that <laughs> that's a bad idea do something else we lost you for the last 20 seconds over there oh sorry no that's all right you're saying something about the vet's average salary ah yeah so um uh, yeah i was just saying that the um, after three years at Cambridge, people were graduating onto salaries of um, 60K. And then I was going to go and study for another three years to earn about half that as, as a starting salary, which is a, you know, a perfectly healthy salary. But in terms of optimizing for income, for earnings, if, if you think that going to vet school is the way to do that, you're wrong. Don't do it. And frankly, we don't want you in the profession either, because um, we're not money motivated individuals. We are animal advocates. We are people that are passionate. And that's something I love about our sector. Uh, and, and I am um, quite strong on this. It's quite easy to achieve alignment in our sector culturally, because if you say we put nation first, pretty much everyone agrees with that. You know? um, and I think we can, I think I keep freezing up, do I? What's going on here with the internet? That's fine. They're still okay over here. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, what I was trying to say there is, in our sector, you can do well by doing good. And the, 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 the reason for that is that we all put the patients first in everything that we do. Mm. And if there, are, if there are any other sort of incentives, ambitions, motivations, other than advocating for animals and advancing animal welfare, um, that would be a worry. That wouldn't be great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. What would your advice be to anybody who wants to be a vet? Let's say they are thinking about it. Should I be a vet or not? You know, we are both vets over here. We've been through vet college. We have both been working for a few different years, a uh, different amount of years, and you have certainly gone to a different sector, but nonetheless, still as a vet. What would your advice be to the young'uns or not so young'uns who wants to be vets? Well, first off, I'd say it's a wonderful, wonderful profession is a fantastic um, thing to study and thing to do. So, um, you know, sometimes when we're talking about burnout and we're talking about rates of depression, it can be a, a, a big no-no, you know, put people off. But I'd say there's a lot of vets having wonderful careers and really enjoying them. I wouldn't change a thing about my approach and I'm doing something that I really love and really enjoy and uh, helps me fulfill my uh, motivations as someone that wants to see um, the advancement of animal welfare. So 
want to start with a positive, the positive message. But if you're sort of going through the process of deciding, what I would suggest is, one, do not make it a foregone conclusion. Um, it's a nice story, right, to say that I always wanted to be a vet. But that became wrapped up in my identity too, at too early a stage. It then became something that like, I felt I had to do because I'd always said I wanted to do it. And for me, that's turned out well. But I don't think that's a, a, a recipe for great success in general. So one, approach it critically. Two, if you are approaching it critically, go eyes wide open into your work experience um, uh, experiences, right? Your work experience experiences. <laughs> Can you say that? Um, but do that. And so I remember going and seeing practice. Um, actually, this is out. This is this is in the U.S. I was on holiday and the. Uh, um, my aunt who lives out in the US, her local vet said, yeah, you can come and see practice with me, with me for a couple of days. And I remember I've got flat feet and I remember coming back, my feet were killing me every day, every day, right? And I was too excited, you know, about having um, seen practice to even let that factor into my uh, consideration. And again, I'll emphasize, I'm glad it didn't, but it should have because Going to work and having your feet ache every day is definitely one for the, you know, you've got your pros and cons list. That goes in the cons list. Like you've got to practically think about what it is to be a vet and what it is to do that job. And that doesn't mean that you can't become a vet. Just maybe being a consulting vet where you have to stand up a lot um, won't, won't be for you. So it, I'm making it sound almost silly, right? But I think that is the level of like, there is, what it, there is the dream of being a vet and then there is what it is to be a vet. And the reality of anything like that doesn't measure up to, to, to the dream um, always. And, and actually you'll find in some ways it's much better than the sort of ethereal dream you had. But in other ways you'll find it's worse. And, and you've got to make sure that, that sore feet is something that you're willing to tolerate for the opportunity to improve the lives of animals and the people that love them and look after them. Uh, for me, uh, that was and, and, and despite going, it, it wasn't the sore feet that made me develop pets up I, I can promise you that but for others it might not be might not be a fair trade-off and so trying to take a I guess I'm advocating for a, as pragmatic approach as possible to that decision making and it is it's a little bit cruel that we force um, people to sort of confront these decisions I think in the UK you kind of have to confront them age 14 because you've got to select your GCSE choices and then you've got to select your A-level choices and then you set your university courses. And I think it's very, um, a very young age to sort of commit to the idea that mm. I want to be a vet and you have no clue what it is to be, to, to really do that job. I, I can appreciate that because I had that thing where I had to commit myself when I was 14 to be able to do GCSEs biology so I could do A-levels biology before I can get apply to vet college. So it exactly. was tricky. I mean, I consider myself as one of the lucky ones who actually knew exactly what I wanted to be compared to many friends, but I can totally appreciate the dichotomy of it as well, whereby if you pick wrong from young and you just have the idea and you become your thoughts, which is not true as well, and you think you're a vet and that's the yeah. only way you can go. So tricky. Yeah. Tom. What I would say there is you, you, that sort of choice, that rush to make the decisions at 18, 14, 16, whenever those decision points are, is artificially imposed. I took two gap years and I didn't start vet school until I was 20. And so I ended up studying uh, history, politics and English literature A-levels as well as the sort of core veterinary A-levels. And I didn't, um, didn't persuade me to do anything other than become a vet, but I still um, am grateful for that time and that, that exploration. And I would encourage people, you know, if you can make that work, um, make it work. Um, if you feel rushed, slow it down. It's okay. It's, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, that's it, Tom. Thank you very much for your time. Of course. It's great. No, seriously, th thanks for your input. That is a uh, very, very good. And uh, certainly very important. I, I learned a lot. And uh, so Same. if, if people want to reach you for pets app, where can they go? So um, you can drop me an email. I'm tom at petsapp.com. That's T-H-O-M at petsapp.com. If you want to learn more about petsapp, petsapp.com is as good a place to start as any. Excellent. I'll make sure that's in the show notes. But thank you very much, Tom. And I look Thanks, forward so. to see you again. Thank you very much. Yes, same. Uh, as for everybody else, please uh, do 
uh, keep your eyes open for pets app. It, it is in the country and it is in uh, many vet practices. Um, I look forward to see your next live event. This is Amity. Okay, I'm just. Uh...